So I want to start looking at axial piston pumps today. There's a few different designs of pist piston pumps in, in mobile equipment, but far and away the most common design is the axial piston pump. And it's called that, sometimes it's called an inline pump, because if you look at where the shaft brings power into the pump, it's a straight run and it's on the same axis as these shiny pistons that you can see. So the pistons and the shaft are lined up, they're on the same axis, so they call this axial. And that doesn't change in this style of pump. The power in this type of pump, when it comes in, we've got a hand crank just attached to this mock-up. The power comes in and what the shaft is doing when it comes brings power into the pump is it's splined into this this cylindrical part called the barrel. Now sometimes this whole rotating group is called the rotating group or sometimes it's called the cylinder block or the cylinder group or something to that effect but it's it's the barrel that actually has the spline in it. So here's a barrel out of an axial piston pump, a little larger one than the one we're looking at here. And you can see a spline inside and that shaft where it comes through the bearing and into the pump is splined in and that's what's turning, that's what's putting the power into the pump. So the barrel is being rotated by the prime mover. So when the pump's turning, we're turning the barrel. Now you're seeing the pistons go around because they don't have much choice, they live in the barrel. So here's another barrel I grabbed that has a piston in it and you can see how the piston sits in the bore. Uh, fairly tight tolerances there, very close uh, fit and finish, generally a few ten thousandths of an inch clearance between the piston and the bore in the barrel. So this oil has to be very clean in these pumps because of the tight tolerances inside the pump. So power goes into the barrel, barrel turns, the piston's got no choice but to follow the rotation of the barrel. And you'll usually find uh, an odd number of pistons, although that's not always the case. This one's got three, six, nine bores for pistons, so it would have nine pistons. This one also has nine pistons. So as I'm turning that shaft, you can see the barrel and the pistons going around. And then on the end of the pistons, there's sort of a ball and socket, and there's this piece called the slipper, or sometimes the slipper shoe, or sometimes the shoe. And then those slippers are generally made out of a softer material. This one looks like steel. Quite often they're a brass uh, slipper or slipper shoe. Um, and that's because they need to slide on this piece that's called the swash plate. Now this mock-up pump has a piece of plastic in it for the swash plate. The, I don't know where the original swash plate is, but somebody's made a mock-up cutaway here. And, and so our swash plate's plastic, but normally it's steel. Here's an example of a swash plate out of a much larger pump. And it's got a steel surface here that shouldn't be rusted like this. This one's definitely not going back into service. And that slipper, as the pump rotates, will slide on the swash plate surface. So because of that sliding function, they're making this out of a softer material, a brass that can handle that sliding onto the, uh, or sliding on the steel surface, can handle a little better. And then you'll notice quite often there's sort of a labyrinth passageway machined into the surface of a slipper, or sometimes just a pocket like this. And that's designed to retain some oil for lubrication of the slipper face as it slides on the swash plate. So if this pump's turning thousands of RPM, as it's going to tend to do at high engine speeds, those slippers are really traveling and they're sliding on their face at high speed. So we need good lubrication there to keep that slipper alive and not score it all up. So it's got this pocket or, or path to contain the oil. And then there'll be a hole through the slipper, just holding this up to the light so we can see that through the socket into the piston, the piston's hollow, and from this side of the piston that does the pumping, there is an intentional leak 
to the surface. So it's pressure oil that's always leaking in here and lubricating that face while it slides on the, on the swash blade at high speed. Very important. Anytime you see someone take a piston pump apart, one of the inspections you're going to have to do is make sure there's no debris uh, plugging that lubrication hole for the slipper. If that slipper runs without oil, it's pretty soon going to look like this one where the brass is all smeared over and that's been destroyed by a lack of lubrication. So it may have been a piece of debris getting in there and blocking that path, that passage. So that is again the piston and the slipper and there's generally nine of these, sometimes there's seven, sometimes there's an even number but it's usually an odd number. Uh, and uh, this end of the piston is actually what's doing the, the pumping. This is the business end. So what you'll notice as that barrel turns with the shaft and the slippers follow the angle that I've got the swash plate on, they're going to be pumping in and out of the barrel. On this end of the barrel, in each piston's bore, there's a little uh, sort of kidney-shaped passage and that, when the piston goes this way, that's going to be drawing oil into that chamber. And when the piston goes this way, that's going to be pushing oil out of that chamber. And then these holes are going to be our suction and discharge. So between this part of the pump housing, which might be called the head of the pump in some assemblies, between that and the rotating barrel, which you'll notice on this pump is there's a sort of a, a thin a thin piece in between there, that's called a port plate. And as the pistons travel back and forth, again, if I angle that swash plate, you can see the pistons on half of the rotation are, are being drawn back towards the swash plate. They're following the swash plate angle. And then once they sort of crest this point and they start going underneath, well, then the swash plate is going to be pushing them into the barrel. So half of the rotation, they're drawing oil in basically from here over to here. These pistons are being pulled back. That's going to be drawing oil in this port through this port plate. And then when the pistons go underneath for the half of the rotation, they're going to be discharging oil out this port. So the port plate is going to look something like this. So that port plate is going to be set up. This one's got six holes in it. Three of the holes are going to be at the top. Three of the holes are at the bottom. The port plate does not rotate, it's stationary. In fact, it sits in the, in the head this way, and there's a dowel there that holds it from turning. So the barrel is turning, again, at potentially thousands of RPM. The port plate is stationary. So once again, we better have some good lubrication there. You can see these kind of castellations in the, in the barrel. They're to let some oil out as oil intentionally leaks between the barrel and port plate surface. So uh, on the surface of the barrel, you're going to see a labyrinth path again, and again, some castellations where oil can get out. So there's intentional leakage here at this surface where the suction and discharge of the pumping elements is happening because we're rotating this at thousands of RPM against a stationary port plate. Again, this one's brass. Sometimes there's steel with a coating on them, but they definitely need lu good lubrication because we've got something spinning uh, and it's turning against that surface. Not only that, the barrel is spring-loaded onto the surface. If we go back to the barrel, when you look inside the barrel of an axial piston pump, what you'll see in there is a big spring coiled up and a snap ring here holding it in. And that's not a snap ring you want to take out without having sort of caged the spring because it's under a fair bit of force. And what that spring does is spring-loads the barrel against that port plate to help it seal. So the spring is engineered to put the right amount of, this is not a match, but put a right amount of force between the barrel and the port plate. But because this is the surface where high pressure oil is being pumped, it's going to be intentionally leaking at this surface. And that's what's going to lubricate the barrel against the port plate as it spins, so we don't destroy that port plate. This one's got some big score and gouging on it, so this one's not going back into surface without, into service without some uh, maintenance to that, that should be a perfectly smooth surface, and the barrel should be as, as an equally good surface, the way we're handling these, setting them on the steel benches, indicative of the fact that they're never going back into service. Now, you might be wondering, 
when the pistons are following the angle of the swatch plate, why are they coming out and following the swatch plate angle? Well, that has to do with this little thin plate in here called a retainer plate or retraction plate. And that plate looks like this. Uh, this one's much thinner than the one I'm holding, but um, basically the, the slippers sit in like that. And as this plate moves with the swash plate, this is, uh, and the rotation happens, this is, it's actually this plate, this retainer plate or retraction plate, that's gonna pull the piston out of the bore. And then we rotate around to the other half of the rotation the swash plate is what's going to push it into the bore. So the swash plate pushes the pistons into the bore, retraction plate pulls them out of the bore, retracts them from the bore. And again, we've got a surface where the, as, the, as the barrel rotates, these slippers are going to rotate in the retraction plate or retainer plate. And what you can see is a lot of wear happened on this one because the oil was dirty as those slippers turned. It really polished up the steel. So this is metal. Sometimes these are powder metal, uh, but they're generally iron, uh, a ferrous metal. And that goes together again to retract those pistons as the rotation happens. So hopefully we're getting the basics of how this operates sort of visually. Um, the swash plate itself, as you may have already guessed, its angle is going to determine the displacement of this pump. If the swash plate's got a very steep angle, well then the stroke length of the pistons as they rotate is quite long. If the swash plate has less angle, then there's less in and out stroking of the pistons. So on a variable displacement pump, something's gonna have control of the swash plate and that's how we're gonna change the displacement. It might be the operator's hand on some linkage it might be some automatic controls if we're talking about load sensing hydraulics. Uh, it might be a pressure limiting compensator. Uh, there's lots of different ways that the swash plate can be controlled and for different reasons in an axial piston pump. But for now, we should just understand the relationship between swash plate angle and displacement. Greater swash plate angle from uh, perpendicular, if it starts to angle this way, greater stroke length of the pistons, more displacement. Multiply that by the pump speed, that's going to give us a higher flow rate at the discharge. So we still have speed with a variable displacement pump. Speed is still a factor in how much pump flow we have, but now so is displacement. We can have an engine turning slow, take the swash plate to a high angle, and still get a fair bit of flow out of this pump, even though we don't have a lot of RPM because we've got a big displacement pump. If, and consequently, if the engine's running at high RPM and we don't want that much flow, well, then the system can either manually or automatically destroke the pump uh, to less displacement, and we can have a pump that's capable of giving us flow rates that aren't directly tied to RPM all the time. We've got this other factor that's going to determine flow rate. Not all piston pumps, not all axial piston pumps are variable displacement. Some are fixed displacement. The swash plate may not move. It may be at a fixed angle. And therefore, the only thing that's going to change the flow rate out of the pump is how fast or slow you turn the shaft. But the axial piston design that we're looking at really lends itself well to being variable. So the majority of the, of the axial piston pumps we're going to see in systems are going to be there because the swash plate does, does and can move and will give us different displacements as the machine works. Going a little back to the barrel for a second, a little deeper in here. Um, again, we've got the pistons sitting in here. Uh, these ones are very short, whatever pump this was out of. The slippers on the end. Uh, inside, again, we've got the spline so the shaft can come in and drive it. And then you'll notice there's three pins here. Those pins are sitting on top of the spring. So the spring that's coiled up in there, when it's trying to stretch out, it's pushing against these pins. What those pins will push up on is this piece called a ball guide, sometimes called a spherical guide or a spherical uh, uh, insert. Uh, but it's also spline because it's got to fit over the shaft where, the, where it's driving the, into the barrel. 
And what it's going to do is take that spring force with these three pins that are pushing it. So the pins are pushing it this way. The barrel's trying to push onto the port plate, but it's the ball guide here that's pushing the opposite way. And the ball guide then fits into the retraction plate. Got a mismatch of parts here. But the ball guide would fit normally into the retraction plate, and that retraction plate is what's going to push the slippers onto the swash plate and keep them in contact. So that spring now that's coiled up inside the barrel is trying to spread out these components. It's trying to push the slippers via their, the, the ball guide. So it's pushing the ball guides, ball guides pushing on the retraction plate, retraction plates pushing the slippers tight against the swash plate. And then the other way, because there's a clip in here and a recess, this way the spring is trying to push the barrel onto the port plate. So all axial piston pumps work on that concept. The spring is trying to push the barrel that way. It's trying to push everything else in the rotating group this way. The traction plate, the ball guide, the slippers, they're all being spring loaded against the swash plate. So when everything's together, that spring might be putting 10, 15 pounds of force. It's going to vary from pump design or manufacturer, just model to model. But uh, it's going to be putting yeah, probably 10 or 15 pounds of force pushing the whole assembly against the swash plate on one end, port plate on the, on the other end. Now, not all axial pumps are going to have uh, a port plate. On some of them, instead of having this port plate, the barrel will run right against the surface of the head. And I've seen some where the surface of the head will have a Teflon coating on it, or sometimes they just run steel on steel. Sometimes the barrel's made, made out of brass or it has a brass uh, material spray welded on it. But better quality pumps, you're going to find this separate port plate in there. Now, this particular port plate, all six holes are the same size. And you may have already said, hey, I thought with pumps, the discharge port was smaller than the suction, and yet these two ports appear to be the same size. Well, that's because this port plate is out of a pump like this, which is bi-directional. So if I got the shaft turning clockwise, and I take my swash plate and I move it to decrease the displacement, I can eventually get to a point where I'm at zero displacement. Pump's turning, but it's not pumping anything, because the pistons are no longer stroking in and out of the barrel. And then if I go over center, I've just reversed where the pistons are drawing in oil and where they're discharging oil. So now I've changed where the suction and discharge oil is on the ports. Now this has become the discharge port. The bottom port has become our suction port. And I didn't have to change the direction of rotation of the pump. I just moved the swash plate over center. So now I've moved it back to the original way. This is the suction. This is the discharge this way, this is the discharge, this is the suction. So this pump would have been out of a hydrostatic drive system. We're kind of getting a look at closed loop or closed circuit hydrostatics. If we took these two hoses and we connected them to a bi-directional hydraulic motor, we would call that system closed loop hydrostatics. So this is out of a hydrostatic pump or this could have been out of a bi-directional axial piston motor because this design of pump also works very well as a hydraulic motor. If we see a port plate that looks like this, well, this is out of a unidirectional pump where the swash plate might still move to change displacement, but it's not going to go so far that it goes over center. So again, where you're going to find uh, symmetrical port plates in hydrostatic drive pumps and bi-directional motors, basically bi-directional pumps and motors. This is out of a unidirectional pump where this is always the suction, so it's going to connect to a bigger port on the head. Uh, if this was sitting this way in the head of this pump, then this port would be much larger for continual suction, and then the discharge port would be through these smaller passages to a smaller port on the head. And the idea there is that uh, on the suction side, they don't want to restrict the oils. They don't want to cavitate the pump. 
On the discharge side, because this is often brass and it's not working at a fairly high pressure, they're giving some reinforcement to the to the uh, port plate so it doesn't the pressure doesn't try and spread it open or distort it. So this one's out of a unidirectional pump.